Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. This is the 2021 uh, presentation sponsored by WSMA, the Washington State Microenterprise Association, the Association of Washington Cities, and WSU Extension. And we are really excited uh, to have these speakers present this innovative and effective strategy of getting money and funding into the hands of very small businesses in rural communities around Washington State. So my name is Lisa Smith. I'm fortunate to be um, the executive director of the Washington State Microenterprise Association. Um, our work is to support nonprofits all over the state that provide comprehensive business training, technical assistance, and microloans to the very smallest businesses that are doing incredible work right now, especially as we are moving out of the pandemic. And as all of you know, uh, small businesses are working every single day to get products to their customers, to manage their cash flow projections, to figure out their marketing strategies, to you know, get their businesses off the ground or to grow those businesses to the next stage. And traditionally they go to a bank or to a micro lender, uh, but often that's, that's also really a very difficult and hard uh, process. But what these speakers have been able to do over the last several years, and some more newer than others, has been able to um, kind of bring together the genius of these business owners and investors who want to invest not necessarily in Wall Street, but in Main Street, and bring them together so that these small businesses can have access to local investment funds to grow their small enterprises. And so we're going to learn a lot today. And without further ado, I'm going to have each member just very, very briefly introduce who they are and what the organization is, and then we'll go into the full uh, webinar. So Andy, let's start with you. Sure, I'm Andy Moran with the Association of Washington Cities. And then we'll go to um, Earl, and then Julie, and then Aslan. Hi, I'm Earl Merman with the Local Investing Opportunity Network in Jefferson County. And I'm Julie Tate Libby, with Program Director um, for Twist Works in the Medhow Valley, um, and I run the Medhow Investment Network. Uh, Aslan Mead with the Thurston Economic Development Council, and we have, uh, host the, the Thurston Investment Network, Think. And then finally, BJ, welcome. I'm BJ Stewart. I'm with Urban Impact, and we have been serving uh, Seattle for 34 plus years, serving under-resourced communities, and we are about to launch a local investment opportunity network in, uh, in an Irving setting in Seattle. Wonderful. Thank you, all of you. And so how this is going to run is um, Andy uh, Meyer I mean, is going to kind of lay the, lay the groundwork for the history of how this has been accelerating the role that you've played. You're going to introduce in, uh, WSU and the work WSU has been doing. Um, and then we'll go into each of the individual investment networks. Um, unfortunately, we had a speaker at the end, or, end of this program, Trevor Lane, who um, has had an, a, a, a medical emergency, so he won't be joining us today. So Andy, we're going to be leaning on you a lot. Uh, so thank you, Andy. Let's, um, you'd start us out, that'd be great. Okay, sure. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for the great introduction. And uh, it's exciting to be here. And and talk more about the local investment networks and the, and, and the work that is happening around the, the state. Um, I'm gonna share a couple of slides to begin with, and then hopefully we'll go to a quick video, which I think will do a better job than I can do um, uh, in these few minutes, but it was sort of introducing why AWC uh, uh, got involved in the local investment network project and why we think it's a great fit for a lot of communities in Washington. So um, quickly, I will share my screen here. Uh, just um, a little bit about me and um, in AWC. So um, everybody see my screen all right? So again, I'm Andy Meyer with the Association of Washington Cities and AWC has been involved in this work for over a decade now. Um, and this next shot is just a, um, a screenshot of our um, uh, uh, web page on our Center for Quality Communities website. The links are embedded in here. 
Um, you can also uh, go to a couple of the other links, WSU Extension. There's some links also to Thurston EDCs and Thurston Thinks uh, work as well. Um, so I'm gonna, anyway, if you wanna do a deeper dive in terms of, of what AWC has been doing in this arena, uh, the link at the top here, cfqc.org would be a great place to spend a little time and see what, uh, what we've done over the, over the past. Uh, there's some videos and some other resources that I think might be helpful as well. So I am going to um, start the video. And I think after that, I'll just say a few words and transition to the next part of our speaker. So let's see. Let's see if this works. Beautiful. Can you increase the volume? Okay, so anyway, that, that video clip and a little bit more is available on our website if you want to do a, a more holistic view at the whole thing. We, we've been involved with this work for about 10 years now. And, and as I think the video showcases, we really saw the need in some of our communities for a, a, a way that uh, local businesses could access capital in a way that wasn't currently being served by uh, uh, existing lenders in the community, and particularly many of the communities lost existing lenders and community-based lending um, um, institutions. So um, I want to give a lot of credit to uh, the Lion Network. Um, they were really the uh, pioneer in this concept in Washington State. It's been tried in other areas of the country, but we leaned on them heavily in terms of developing our uh, initial uh, model that we then worked with our partners at WSU Extension to try and develop sort of a templated toolkit that other communities could take uh, uh, and sort of lower the, bar the barrier to entry, if you will, uh, to allow other communities who wanted to work on this concept in their community to try it out. So, so those resources are available not only from AWC, but certainly from WSU Extension. And as many of you may know, they have resources in every county in, in Washington state, and they've been a great partner over this last decade. So, um, Anyway, we, we continue to champion the LIN concept as a great model for keeping local dollars working in communities. And we've really seen a growing interest in the local investment network model, certainly over the last four or five years, but even more so the last couple of years, I think coming out of the pandemic as people are beginning to think differently about how to really uh, bring back some of the economy and local communities that was lost or sidelined in the last few years. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to some of our partner speakers and talk a little bit about their efforts and we'll 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 take it from there. Thank you, Lisa. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Andy, so much. And my hope is at the end of this, you can maybe share a little bit about what Trevor would have presented on, you know, where some of the new emerging uh, lens are, etc. I'd be glad so to. That was an excellent foundation. Thank you so much. And we're going to go to Julie Tate Libby after this. And um, we're excited you're up in TWISP and the kind of innovation you've been able to do in that very rural and remote community is awesome. So take it away, Julie. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, 
Um, my, again, my name is Julie Tate Libby from uh, the Twist Works and the Medhow Investment Network. Um, so one of the things I love about local investment networks is that each one is different and they really do take on the character and the, the shape and the culture of their community. Um, so in the Medhow Valley, we are a recreation, um, a Nordic ski destination and um, we're highly dependent on a recreational economy and tourism. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the network here and how it's adapted to our community and um, some of the things that we've been doing with it. Um, so as you can see, this is Washington Pass, um, lots of recreation, mountain biking, skiing, rock climbing, and things like that. Um, the Medhaw Valley has 6,000 full or 400 full-time residents. So this is a rural um, community. There's about 4,000 part-time residents. So our part-time um, population really influences our demographics um, and some of the issues that we face. Um, as I said, it's outdoor recreation. Um, and one of the things we've seen, in, particularly with COVID, is a rise in remote work um, and people moving to the Medhaw uh, full-time or spending more time in the Medhaw Valley. So we've faced a significant amount of growth and structurally uh, um, parts of our economy have, have not really kept up to that growth. <clears throat> We have 535 small businesses um, and we launched a concerted uh, business outreach effort during COVID-19, the organization um, that I work for, TwistWorks. Uh, we contacted each business and we provide business support um, and recommendations and along with the Medhaw Investment Network. Um, but one of the things that we realized while we were contacting our businesses is that these businesses are very, very small in the Medhaw Valley. A lot of people uh, move to the Medhaw to be entrepreneurs um, rather than to work for somebody else. And actually most of our business community makes uh, less than 40,000 a year. So again, these are very small businesses. These are not huge corporations and um, they represent <clears throat> a significant portion of our demographic, about 20% actually. 40% um, of our businesses have no employees. They're completely owner run. Um, and then 60% of our working families make less than 50,000 a year. So some of these demographics were really surprising to us. Um, we launched um, a business outreach, like I said, and we surveyed um, all these businesses that we have in the Medha Valley. So this information was new to us and we've been presenting this to our network to help our local investment network understand the business community um, that, that they represent. Along with that, the average cost of a home um, today is almost $500,000 in the Medha Valley. So you can see kind of the structural inequality where we have um, a very, very limited housing stock and the price of housing is um, beyond most local families reach. So the Medha Investment Network um, started in 2017. Um, it was part of an outreach um, after the 2014 and 2015 wildfires that really decimated um, our economy. Um, and so it's been a rapidly expanding organization. Uh, currently, we have 86 investors. Um, and as of today, we have invested over $4 million in our local economy. And 1 million of this was actually invested during COVID-19. Um, at the beginning of COVID, we weren't sure how things were going to play out and if investors uh, were pretty hesitant to invest. But um, this year alone, we, had, we have actually funded six startup businesses and seen the um, one local business acquisition um, in 2021. So that's really encouraging to us. We have a really engaged network. Um, and so we've been able to give out 21 loans to small businesses. Um, and we um, estimate that our business network, including the owner run and the employees represents about 1500 people um, in our economy. So um, let me know if this, plays or doesn't play. Hopefully you guys should hear it. So um, maybe Aslan, you can give me a thumbs up. I can see you if this works. We don't have any volume, but we see it. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop share and do this again. Um, Make sure you press those little boxes uh, in the lower left-hand corner yeah. and then your yeah. audio will work great. Yeah. Thank you. This bug was terrible last time. <laughs> we have plenty of time. You're doing fine. Okay, great. Make sure your volume Our community up. would not be where it's at today, okay. especially small great. businesses, if it wasn't for TwistWorks. It's because of Methow Investment Network that I am here right now in business and thriving. This is what in the other place would be called a small business incubator because people are able to 
come here, start a business here. This is a place where they can feel welcome and stable and have a chance to make their business work. Our business is dramatically in a, in a better position because of TwistWorks through the Met Howe Investment Network and through being able to expand more quickly than we would have been able to. Being here on the TwistWorks campus, we're able to make twice the amount of beer that we used to make. And when we're at full capacity with more tanks, we'll be at 5X. When I bought the business, Met Howe Made was really there for me. Just an offer of whatever I needed if I needed help to get funding or getting classes or training with QuickBooks or connecting me with the right people. Partnering with TwistWorks as far as arts and culture for the town of Twist has been a huge catalyst to start moving the town forward. And TwistWorks has been the backbone in all of that movement. There's been a lot of creating of momentum that's helped get the town kind of swinging in the right direction. And as an arts and culture advocate, it's a huge help to have such you know, a dedicated and passionate partner. This is not typical in a lot of communities. I think it's a special thing. I'm glad TWISP has it. I hope TWISP appreciates it because this is a very difficult kind of project to put together and to sustain over 10 years and to look down the road and see that it's sustainable for a lot longer. Our community would not be. Beautiful. All right, thank you so much. So as you can see, um, so the Meta Investment Network um, basically gives out uh, loans to startup businesses, business acquisitions, um, and other um, you know entrepreneurs that would have um, that would have an at-risk loan or have a hard time accessing funds. Um, so one of the things that we think is really exciting is that um, by giving these loans or making loans to small businesses like this, we can reach across socioeconomic boundaries. Um, so when we pair investors with local people in the Metau, um, we're pairing people from different economic groups, different backgrounds, um, and it can be a really helpful partnership. So a lot of our investors also um, work with our um, or with the entrepreneurs that they're loaning to and they go over business plans and proposals and it kind of creates like a mentoring relationship between uh, people who want to start a business um, and who don't have that kind of experience. So um, one of the things we're really excited about is to launch a housing subchapter. Um, we just convened, we had our first meeting last week. We had a very animated conversation on affordable housing and how local investment networks can be involved in affordable housing. Um, and one of the ways that we are um, researching our involvement is to support and finance ADUs or accessory dwelling units. Um, and this is something that um, we're just beginning. We haven't actually done one yet, and there are other local investment networks who have, so um, hopefully they can speak to that. Um, but we're working on fostering kind of a, a plentiful ADU ecosystem to help with our workforce housing um, and elder housing. Uh, we're also working on a couple larger projects that um, would involve integrated capital. Um, this would be capital in the form of private equity and also um, perhaps a Venn model of um, donation-based um, financing. So um, put, we're trying to figure out ways to put that together to finance a larger housing project um, that would have um, the most relevance in our community. Um, Again, we engage in our business outreach. Um, we just completed our comprehensive economic study um, this last month. And um, out of the four surveys that we launched, we had over 1,000, actually 1,058 residents that responded to that. Um, we launched a rural changes in the MedHow class series. Um, and we were able to really beef up our healthy economy program through this business outreach and kind of having this very holistic, integrated understanding of um, the local investment network and how that supports businesses um, and other things that we can do to support um, our business community. Um, we've also launched a what, looks, what Local Looks Like shopping campaign for Christmas. Um, and we've um, been instrumental in getting the Small Business Emergency Grant out. Uh, we've given 93 grants out over the past 18 months. Um, this was for COVID relief. And then this summer, we launched this for wildfire relief. These grants give out $1,500 to $5,000 to small businesses who've been severely impacted by COVID or by wildfires. And so we've been able to raise and to distribute $162,000 um, throughout our community. 
So these are some of the things that Twistworks has been doing as a whole. And um, throughout all of this, the Medha Investment Network has been kind of our cornerstone program that really helps to support these businesses without having access to capital. Um, these businesses would not be able to, um, to open or to operate or to launch at all. So um, in our community, this has been really instrumental. And I think that that is it. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. And if there's any questions, I can take those at the end or however we wanna do that, Lisa. Yeah, I think it would be great if we had a chance for all the speakers first, and then um, anybody who has a question, put it in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, just excellent presentation, Julie. Thank you so much. Uh, I love that video as well. So next we're gonna to go to Earl Merman, who's with the Local Investment Opportunity Network on the Northern, North Olympic Peninsula. And Earl, you are an amazing human, and I'm excited to hear about the work you've been doing. You're, you're the oldest and the most established Lynn in the state, and we're grateful that you're here. Yeah, looking at the screen, I think I'm the oldest person here, too. Oh, come on. We're not talking about that. <laughs> Julie, congratulations on what you're doing over there in Meadow Valley. It's just really impressive how you ramped up. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start with a little video that Sherry's going to share. It's a four and a half minute video about Lion, and then I'm going to show some slides that give you some more quantitative profiles of local investing. Thank you to Sheree for getting this all together. Lion is the Local Investment Opportunity Network. It's a group of people who came together that decided to uh, start to invest in small businesses. Aldrich's has been around since 1895. It's the longest continuously operated grocery store in Washington State. Well, of course, you know, the whole community knew when Aldrich's closed its doors for good. And so many of us were just saddened by that. There was a spirit to the place, and it was still kind of imbued there. When they closed down, it was just, it was an offhand remark. I said, well, I'll just close down. Why don't we buy Aldrich's? We had no idea what was going to happen, but it was just one of these kind of things that just felt right. We got a notice from Lyon that there was a group of people that had bought Aldrich's and they were looking for a little bit of help in the opening of it. Typical banks will lend you money if you have money. Typically, Lion loans are uncollateralized, so there's a promissory note and there's money given, and that allows people to start businesses who are at the beginning rung of building their wealth. I was really just taken by the whole concept of actually using my money to help local businesses in the community. Hey, dear, how are you today? Are you doing well? How are you doing? The reason we did seek out Lion was is that we decided that we could use, you know, just a little cushion. They did a, a Zoom presentation. I really liked what I heard. And so I went home and thought some more and said, hey, I'd like to loan you a little bit of money. To be supported by Lion really made it feel truly like we were doing the right thing. Very, very meaningful. And we've developed friendships along the way. The impact that Lion has um, has been in many layers. So you have continued employment over time, and then of course, making sure that that money stays local is huge, particularly for a small rural community like us. So we're dealing with, I wanna say, it's probably upwards of 100 local growers, producers, purveyors, Maker. suppliers, makers, artists. And I think that Lion is, is certainly a very important chunk in regard to, I think, connecting a lot of dots and how you can create this more holistic community where you're not 
having people that have money from outside looking just to profiteer off of something where it's actually it's the care about the community more than it is about the almighty money. Local investing helps build strong communities by keeping the money locally, by forming interrelationships with, with businesses, by developing a community of people who are all involved. So I think these are the kinds of things we need in our, our communities to bring them together. We see ourselves as stewards of Aldrich's. That's our job. Yeah, to keep the little heartbeat alive. I don't want a town without these small businesses surviving. So investing in my local businesses makes my life richer. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Sherry. I'm going to now share some slides. That was so impressive, Earl. Let's see. Okay, so to uh, to kind of complement the story, this is going to be kind of a cross section of data that we've collected from our Lion members on surveys, and the full results are available uh, on the web link there. So this shows the kind of history of Lion in two charts. One is the blue line, which shows that over about 12 years, the Lion 72 Lion members have invested about $10.5 million. And you can see it's pretty steady, pretty steady. It's not ups and downs, it's pretty steady. And that's been a total of 313 investments in 96 different businesses, nonprofits, and a few real estate uh, activities. So the video featured a business from the food and farm sector, which is the yellow sector on this pie charts of different economic sectors in the county. But you can see that the local investors uh, have invested in at least four, maybe five of these sectors, uh, quite a few uh, investments in advanced technology manufacturing and small businesses and entrepreneurs in real estate and tourism and retail. And the median amount invested per business was $28,750. However, the range went from a minimum of $1,000 invested in one business to $2.2 million in another business. So it covers the spectrum, uh, which is one of the, uh, I think, beauties of this local investing. It can be open to even smaller, larger uh, businesses. Uh, this chart shows the amount of the, the different amounts invested. So uh, on, the, on the bottom here, we have the amount of an individual investment. And on the top, we have a cumulative uh, listing of, of total investments. And you can see that uh, about 15% of the investments made were under $5,000. About a third were under $10,000 or less. 60% were under were $20,000 or less. So, a lot of these investments are small investments, uh, which opens it up to a wide range of investors. And the actual investments range on the low end from $500 to the high end of almost uh, half a million dollars. Again, quite a wide range. And then my last slide just kind of gives you a little profile of some of these investments. 71% uh, run secured promissory notes. 14% had collateral associated with the loan. 10% were equity investments, 2% were mixed equity loan, and 3%, we don't know what they were. And in terms of the loans, the average interest was about 5.4%, about and the average duration about a little over five years for a typical loan. And then the box on the right shows the status of these 330 investments about a year ago now. And you can see about a third were repaid by then, about a third were current, uh, some defaulted, and the defaults are two types. One is, so the, in the survey, the default was defined as the loan payment stopped, but a number of those defaults restarted. So it's not unusual for small businesses to run into cash flow problems, and uh, local investors are pretty flexible to handle that. 
And then some of the loans have been modified. The owned ones were equity. These were just different things that happened. I remember there was one non loan made to a nonprofit, which was converted into a donation. And uh, the bottom line just shows we didn't have answers for it. So that's uh, at least one, uh, one view into local investing from a group that's um, been at it for about 12 or 13 years. So I'll turn it back to you, Lisa. Bravo. I wish there were some emojis down here that, so I could do a clapping thing. <laughs> Nicely done, both the video and the update on your statistics. Um, really impressive. Thank you, Earl. So now we're going to go to our newer uh, partner on the scene, and that's BJ Stewart from Urban Impact in Seattle. And um, what's unique about BJ is that um, he's a part of an organization that is a microenterprise development organization doing business technical assistance and training for entrepreneurs to get started to grow that pipeline. And so we're very, very excited uh, that you're here. And I wanna say to those of you in the audience, please put your questions in the chat and we'll get these to the speakers at the end. All right, BJ, go for it. Thanks, Lisa. Hello, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen here. Bear with me while I get my presentation up. Okay. All right, so hopefully you can see that okay. So Urban Impact is a, a nonprofit that has been operating in Seattle for uh, 34 plus years. And our mission is to break the cycle of, of poverty. And what that really acknowledges is that uh, poverty has to do with more than one's economic condition. Yes, economics is, has a part of it, but uh, also we want to give rise to uh, folks' disconnection from a social perspective and from a spiritual perspective as well. So we have a wide variety of, of, of programming that really meets the felt needs of the under-resourced in our in our in the communities that that we serve, and that ranges from an affordable housing um, uh, community. Uh, to a, a gym, which closes the health and wellness gap. And what I'll be talking about this afternoon is our uh, focus on creating a local vibrant, uh, a vibrant local economy uh, based on supporting local entrepreneurs and small businesses and the under-resourced communities that, that we serve. So um, while most of the folks here serve uh, rural uh, outlying areas, the Sea Lion, the Seattle Local Investment Opportunity Network is really geared for an urban context. And really what we're looking to do is to leverage an already successful model and adjust it for an urban context. And one of those um, points of differentiation, as Lisa mentioned, was that really our Local Investment Opportunity Network was founded out of the wraparound services that we uh, provide for um, local entrepreneurs and small businesses, and in, in most cases, it's going to be the other way around. The um, local investment network started and then the, identified the need to provide some of those services. So that's uh, part of uh, the adjusting or the difference between what we're trying to do here in Seattle and what already exists in um, more rural locations. So is, as you look at the problem that we're looking to solve from um, an urban, a Seattle under-resourced neighborhood perspective is the reality is that in Seattle, there's a growing income and wealth gap. And there's a variety of, of statistics that I can throw at you from uh, the median value of, of, of homes to um, median income to uh, more health and well, wellness related uh, statistics to uh, even um, uh, the, the poverty rates that exist in one neighborhood versus uh, another. Uh, and those, uh, that phenomena relative to the growing income and wealth gaps leaches into the impact on those entrepreneurs and small businesses that serve those communities. And the reality is that small businesses and under-resourced communities in many respects lack the resources, lack the relationships, that's needed to garner the resources that they need. Um, they lack the business acumen. 
um, to effectively deal with the issues that they face every day. And maybe most obviously they lack the financial resource. And I don't wanna paint a, a kind of general white brush here, but really what we're uh, talking about are those micro enterprise uh, those micro enterprise startups and early stage micro enterprises that exist in under resourced communities. And that has been uh, compacted or, uh, or additionally impacted by the impact of, of COVID 19, which has disproportionately affected um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color uh, around the country. And certainly that exists in Seattle as well. So, our solution is to, to, to really close those gaps dealing with the relationship gap that I mentioned by creating social capital through mentorship and coaching, closing that knowledge and information gap by providing um, application-based business training, and then connecting these folks to the resource, the financial resources that they need. And, you know, maybe obviously the local investment opportunity network that we're establishing uh, more directly connects the folks in our ecosystem to the financial resources that they need. And our thought is, our logic model is, if we cover these gaps, building social capital, knowledge capital, and financial capital, that will lead to the sustainability of micro enterprises and sp in, in small businesses and in under resourced communities, really positioning them uh, to participate in the growing tide of, of uh, economic activity that will occur in many of these communities as um, quite frankly, the, the folks that aren't doing as well get pushed out by, um, by development and, and redevelopment. Well, you know, uh, gentrification uh, only exists if, if displacement occurs. So if we're able to invest in those local entrepreneurs, invest in those local small businesses. So those business owners, those entrepreneurs, their families and employees stay in place. Then we have um, a situation where development and redevelopment and investment can coexist with um, the folks who are already in place and you know, gentrification isn't an issue. So that's a, a summary of, of our solution. So why is this important? Well, there's an altru altruistic reason why this work is important from a social justice and racial reconciliation perspective. We only need to look back to some of the racial and civil unrest uh, that, uh, that we, wit we all witnessed last year. Uh, and this mechanism with the, really brings the community together and in and really using the language and uh, modality of business uh, for social justice and racial reconciliation. And there's also a business case reason why this is important. As you uh, look back historically in the 2010-2012 economic recovery after the 2008-2009 uh, Great Recession, it is the local small businesses, those businesses under 20 people that drove 70% plus of the new job growth. So we believe that if we invest in local small business, that um, will um, lead to their participation in the rising tide of economic activity post COVID. And that leads to our vision. Our vision is transforming and empowering local entrepreneurs and small business owners. So it is them, it is they who transform the communities where they work and live. So who do we serve? Well, I'm going to point to this young lady here over in the lower left-hand corner, that's Monica Matthews. And Monica is the owner of a Queen Care Products. And uh, Monica has participated in Urban Impact's Sharks at the Beach program, which I'll describe here momentarily, and our Small Business Accelerator. So um, Lisa mentioned uh, that our approach is to really build a pipeline, pipeline of entrepreneurs. Well, Monica is a great example of that, where she participated in our Sharks at the Beach program as a microenterprise startup, and, that's, and then she took advantage of the continued uh, business services through our Thrive Business Accelerator. And wouldn't you know, uh, some, what, four years later, Monica not only has one location, but she has two brick and mortar locations. And um, uh, part of the uh, per objective and, and perspective of establishing this local investment opportunity network is to uh, con uh, continue to serve Monica and entrepreneurs, small businesses like her, as they grow and their uh, needs for financial and their financial needs grow as well. So Monica is definitely one of those um, uh, success stories, and there are many more. I, I'm happy to, to to share. 
So I mentioned this idea of transforming entrepreneurs in tr to transform so they can transform their communities. And we really do that through two programs, our Sharks at the Beach Entrepreneurship Program, which is a 12-week is a uh, business training uh, course really geared toward microenterprise startups and very early stage, I'll call it uh, side hustlers and side and hobbyists where they're you know, really operating out their garages and, and kitchens. Well, the idea of Sharks at the Beach is to get them to officially launch their enterprises and doing so with a solid foundation and in a, a sustainable way. And then uh, three years ago, as well, we, it, uh, Sharks at the Beach, that program has been around for nine years. So the next program will be our ninth edition of that entrepreneurship program. Three years ago, we identified the, the need to, for additional support for these entrepreneurs. So we launched Thrive um, Business Accelerator to provide that secondary level of support for Sharks at the Beach grads. And then it allows us to wrap our arms around other local small businesses and entrepreneurs in the communities that we serve. So that leads to this uh, community investment and loan fund that we're looking to uh, establish through uh, laying the foundations for what I'm calling Sea Lion, which is short for the Seattle Local Investment Opportunity Network. And our objective here is to do two things and all for the purpose and objective of building community wealth. One, we wanna provide uh, capital to those enterprises in, uh, in our ecosystem. So the Monica Matthews of the world, we wanna be there to more directly meet their financial needs. Cur today, we are working with local community development funding institutions, credit unions, uh, other alternative uh, funding uh, to indirectly uh, fund these folks' uh, capital needs. Well, through the establishing establishment of Sea Lion, we can do that more directly, really closing the donut hole that many of these entrepreneurs are experiencing. And the reality is that loans from five to $50,000 the banks really don't find those loans. They don't make money off those loans. So guess what? They don't make, they, they don't uh, uh, loan typically um, make loans in that donut hole. So our objective is to provide affordable uh, patient capital. And at the same time, investing in the Monica Matthews of the world, developing our pipeline of fundable maturing enterprises. And then on the investor side of the house, really what we wanna do is provide investment opportunities to the grassroots uh, Jane and Joe in the communities that, that we serve. Um, yes, um, accredited uh, investors and those well-to-do may be, may be engaged in the initial seedings of our uh, loan fund and, and investment fund, but we really want to reach down to those folks um, who really don't think of themselves as participants, as investors, and really say, hey, you have the opportunity to invest in the small businesses that support your neighborhood. So uh, from an investment perspective, we're looking to attract uh, patient, philanthropic, mission-focused investment uh, uh, while uh, building a diverse capital stack. So uh, Lisa, that's all I have to say. Here's my contact information, and it looks like this uh, deck will be um, uh, uh, presented as part of the uh, package, and uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Lisa. Wow, bravo. Uh, I just, um, it's remarkable how far you've come in such a very short amount of time. Uh, so thank you, beautifully done. Um, so we're going to go to Aslan Mead, who is a rock star down in Olympia, Washington, and is going to be talking about Think. And, you know, just just for all of you on this call, like, so Julie T Julian Twisp has a connection, you know, with several partners um, up in, to, that help build that pipeline, and you have your own pipeline. Um, Earl has... Uh, Center for Inclusive Entrepreneurship and Enterprise for Equity is a pipeline microenterprise development organization. And BJ, you have Business Impact Northwest and Ventures. And Aslan, you have your own like powerhouse of entrepreneurship with, within the EDC and, the, and your nonprofit foundation, as well as Enterprise for Equity. So as you think and hear about these speakers, know that they're, they're stronger when they have that robust community of businesses. So thank you. Go ahead, Eslin. Thank you, Lisa. It is so, it is just so inspiring always to meet with this group and to hear your stories and hear your successes and hear the support for these small businesses. It's just so, always so inspiring. So 
Um, I'm going to just get my presentation up and running here. Uh, all right, everyone see me all right here. Um, yeah, and I do want to give a shout out, especially to Earl and the Lion Network. They really are the model. Uh, you know, it was many, many years ago, um, I think 2011, that I first heard of, uh, of Lion and just such an inspiring model of direct investment from local community members into small businesses. And, and especially at that, that time coming out of the recession, it was so inspiring. Um, I also, a big shout out, especially to WSU and, and AWC, they really helped the, low, the Thurston Investment Network uh, launch when we were launching, you know, spent a lot of time developing out the materials and the trainings and, and all the things that we would need the support to launch as well. And, and then even uh, uh, TWISP, um, they launched around the same time the Think Network did, and I actually got to go up there and see their very first business pitch and you know again it's just so inspiring to see it in action and actually get to to see the the, the work that's being done so so anyways uh the thurston investment network i'm just going to hit on this really quickly you know we did launch in 2017 uh nine deals to date about 1.1 million total investment um uh i i really want to kind of move forward here so i'm not going to hit on this i i do want to just hit i don't think anyone spent much time on this so just really quickly um as Lisa said, you know, we at the Thurston ADC, we have a Center for Business and Innovation. We have a small business development center there, the Washington Center for Women in Business, uh, PTAC, Procurement Assistance Center, uh, Technical Assistance. You know, so we do have that pipeline of helping businesses that are looking already to, to launch or to expand, and that is really helpful. But the network is really the, the investment network refers to the investor side of the equation. And those are separate things. While the EDC administers the network, um, it's really a matchmaking situation where we help the businesses prepare, we'll help them with their business plans, we'll even have to help them practice their pitch, then we get them in the room with a bunch of investors, they pitch, and then we step out of the way, and it's really uh, uh, up to the interested investors and the businesses to figure out the details. The business may uh, pitch specific uh, uh, a re rate of return uh, or what they're looking for, but it's really a negotiation that takes place. And it could be one investor that ends up investing or it could be nine investors that are investing. And it, you know, they work all those details out and we pro provide that framework. So just wanted to give a really quick shot to that. Um, today, I really, I'm gonna spend most of my time just talking about a little case study and success story. Uh, I wanna talk about Trestle. Uh, they make, uh, they, they, they are a couple of young engineers that make outdoor sporting good gear. Uh, they were the very first business we ever invested in at the very the January of 2018. Uh, it, it was really exciting moment for our first investment, you know, matching investors with a local business. Um, but Trestle just came back to the network after having several years of success and growing. They are now in more than 80 stores across the country, have a real uh, incredible following on social media. Uh, they've done a fantastic job with marketing. And now they all, all they are in a position now with such interest that they can almost double the stores or, or more than double the stores uh, that they're in across the country. Um, and so they're actually having some issue just with um, inventory, right? To be able to produce that much to make that giant jump. And so they came back to the network. Um, and I just thought that that is a great story. And so just really quickly, um, you can see just as an example, that top uh, product they make is, you know, it's for fly fishing. You can keep your rods fully extended and, and, and with the reel intact, and you can drive from one location to the other. They snap on the top of your car easy. They, they've really thought this through, really smart young uh, engineers. Uh, that was their original flagship project product. Uh, they have been developing products along the way. They actually found out while they were doing their first batch of manufacturing, they had created a kind of apparel line for fun, working with local artists, uh, and that took off. And they say that actually their their apparel actually is a leader to get them in stores now. They actually hold a lot of end caps and things of that nature. That that it's actually their apparel actually leads to the store sometimes carrying their products. Um, they are in you know a lot of big name stores. If if you're into outdoor sporting goods. Um, they they have been really smart marketers. They you know they really led even before their products were available. They had done pre sales and and had really developed up this their marketing. And they're just they've done everything right with sales reps across the country. Um, this is their new product. They're coming up. They're matching up their love for 
things like fly fishing with uh, mountain biking. And, and so they're creating systems where you can carry your gear out deeper into the wilderness. And so this is launching this coming year. Um, just you know, to hit on these things really quick, it really is that piece of ex uh, adding the 100 to, to 80 to 100 new sportsmen's warehouses in 2022 that they came back to the network. And so just really want to show that both the success of where they're at um, and where they're heading. Um, and again, just a smart young business. You know, they've done everything right. They've really prepared themselves for the, the growth that's coming. They've done everything they've needed. And then they need to the investment piece. And so, you know, they are successful enough now that they can go to a bank, but they chose to come back to think. And, and this is the slide I want to spend just a minute on and just talk about that. Like they chose to come back to think. And if you look at what some of the things they're saying here, it's like they actually want to help elevate the local investment network, right? They want to bring attention to local investing so it can, it, it can uh, affect and, and support other businesses in our community. Um, just a little shout out there, SPSCC is our local community college, South Puget Sound Community College. Uh, they're actually now using the advanced manufacturing class at SPSCC to manufacture some of their parts and, and so empowering students in that process. So um, I guess the, you know, that bullet point at the end is a good point to know that you know, their initial relationships with the investors brought more than funding, right? It, it brought advice and it brought wisdom and knowledge and and. And you know that's something that they they you know it's not just the money that helped them be successful to take it to this next stage. Uh, it has also been that relationship with the investors, and so they really they 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 laud that piece. So so and certainly more to tell, but I thought I'd just share that story. I'm I'm very proud of that moment and of this business, and I'm excited to see where they go to next. Beautiful. Excellent. Wow. Thank you, Aslan. We, I had no idea they had grown so big so fast. And what a, what a powerful um, connection between the small grocery store in Port, Ant, Port, uh, Port Townsend to the beer company there, uh, there in Julian Twist Works and the, um, the small business up in Seattle. So very incredibly impressive. You know, I know we have just a little bit of time, uh, but I wanted to make sure folks had a chance to ask some questions, and then I have some closing remarks. And um, one of the questions I think was covered, but um, you know, it, it had to do with how these lions started and how, how how did they how did you get started? And so I was hoping Andy. Uh, you would talk a little bit. We have on this call like Bill Fashing from Wakayakum County, and we have Steve Shapiro from Whidbey Island. We have, you know, folks all over the state who come together every month in a community of practice that we've started. So maybe you could answer that, Andy. Like, what do people do if they want to start? Well, sure. Thanks, Lisa. Um, well, first of all, I'm going to give a shout out to you, Lisa, and WSMA for really helping to convene this community of practice and sort of keep us going. And Oslan, I know, has really pitched in as a convener and a coordinator as well. But I think that's helped to take this whole network and this uh, following, if you will, around the state to another level. And that's that's really been awesome. So when, when the whole concept really got started with AWC and WSU Extension, um, we really um, looked around uh, at places and tried to sort of promote it with our conference and some of our other outreach uh, tools that AWC and WSU Extension have. They talked it up at some of their extension agent groups. Um, and we began to hear from communities. Um, actually, the, the Thurston folks were one of the first, excuse me, uh, beyond Thurston, then, um, then the, the MIN, uh, the Metro Investment Network, and we also worked with a group in Collin County called COIN. Uh, and really, uh, I think what it's, it really takes uh, an entity that is interested or a person that's interested in becoming a local champion and really sort of developing the conversation within the community, getting the level of interest and excitement building. Sometimes that's a chamber. Sometimes that is a group like the EDC. Uh, sometimes it's even a passionate elected official who takes it to the Rotary Club and says, you know, hey, you know, other communities are doing this, you know, this might be a good fit for us. Um, 
And then I think with some of the resources that WSU Extension has got, and certainly AWC has been there as a convener and a, and a connector, um, we can connect you with the places, uh, the toolkit, some of the resources, uh, the, the forms and the guidebooks, if you will, that are out there. And now, of course, we have this community of practice. So you can plug in, basically, in this community, learn from all of these folks that you see on the screen and more, um, uh, and hear about what's going on, you know, what some of the challenges are, and, and also what some of the successes are. So I think that, you know, we've really, um, we've, we've come a long way since 10 plus years ago, when it was just a few of us trying to sort of push this concept beyond what Lyon was doing in Port Townsend and, and give it some exposure on a statewide basis where uh, I think the concept is so powerful, it really can take off. Um, but removing those barriers of entry, the, the sort of the question that people have about, you know, what kind of forms and what about securities and exchange laws and where does the Department of Financial Institutions fit in? And I think we've removed a lot of those and certainly the, the expertise and the knowledge base that is now uh, uh, in, in this arena uh, in the state uh, can really help people take it um, from just starting to that next level. Excellent. That was really well, well covered. And, and Aslan, I appreciate too, when you did really the nuts and bolts of how this investor network works. And so that was really great. There was one other question I want to cover before we uh, go to closing remarks. And that was, how do you define mixed equity loan, a, a mixed equity loan? Can you give an example? Um, whoever wants to answer that. Yeah, I was the one that put that term up. So let me, let me say that. I can think of a couple examples that one of them was a, a loan that was made and then converted to equity. And another one was just a business where an investor or some investors both made loans and made equity investments. So it, that, that, those were two examples I can think of. Wonderful. Anyone else want to pipe in there? Okay. Well, I just want to say we are near the end. We've just got a, a few minutes more. I wanted to, <clears throat> first of all, say that there are investment networks all over the state, and we want to increase the opportunity for those who want to start a local investment network in your community to have the tools that you need. And we couldn't be more grateful to have Andy with AWC and WSU Extension who can walk you through the process. They actually have a template and a, a pathway. So um, feel free to contact me or them or however you wanna do it. You know, that's one thing. Uh, I also wanted to just say that the work that we're doing at WSMA wouldn't be possible without the Department of Commerce here in Washington State. They've been a tremendous leader in supporting us and the work we're doing to help microenterprise development organizations all over the state including BJ and, and Think and Twistworks. And so I want to give a shout out to the Department of Commerce and the work we're able to do. Um, this last spring, WSMA funded $1.6 million to 43 nonprofit organizations around the state. 52% of those were to BIPOC-led or Black, Indigenous, and other people of color-led nonprofits. And what that's going to do is grow that pipeline. So building networks of local investment networks in these small communities will advance this goal. Um, I also wanted to say that we have some very cool events coming up. I don't know, if Julie, if you would give us a one-two about the January 26th event. Sure, um, so on January 26th um, at five o'clock, we're gonna be doing a virtual event um, for local investment networks across the state of Washington, and the focus will be on housing um, and how investment networks can invest in housing solutions in their communities. Um, and we have our guest speaker is Bill Barberg. Um, he is a housing specialist, and he's going to be joining us and doing a keynote speak um, speaking. And then we will divide up into small groups and focus on specific housing issues. Um, and investor um, networks related to that. So we're really excited for that event. And um, we've raised all the money to fund this guest speaker and it's been a really awesome collaborative experience. So thank you to all my co-speakers. 
Awesome. Thank you, Julie, for taking the lead. Every community I work with is struggling to find housing just for medical staff or school staff. And so this is just one more step toward uh, raising opportunity and, and uh, information about uh, how we can solve the housing, housing problem. I wanted to say also that Michael Schumann, kind of our, our, our hero, uh, did several events last year and he will be doing another class in March of 2022. And that is really a powerful opportunity for anyone here who wants to just get to the nuts and bolts, understand you know, your potential as an investor or learn more about this. It's really tremendous. Um, and I don't know if anyone was at the last one can give a one-two about that. I don't know, if BJ, were you were you in that? Yeah, yes, I was. And in really it it what it for me, what it helped to do is is connect the the dots um, uh, relative to the the work that uh, it was already done in terms of some of the templates and methodology that's already laid out. Um, uh, even even in that environment, it was you know it's like okay, well, where do I start? Well, it. Uh, it provided a lot of background information, one, in terms of um, just kind of local investing in, in, in general. Uh, and, um, uh, and then it addressed some of the regulatory issues as, as well, as that was kind of a key question that I had. And then that class, along with the work that um, WSU Extension and um, AICP has, has, has put together in terms of the how to get started field guide um, has made my process a lot easier. Awesome, awesome. And I noticed a comment from Bill Fashing with the Lower Columbia Investment Network. They recently held their first event and they're looking for their first deal very soon in the near future. So that's pretty great. Thank you, Bill. Another comment here from Mariah McKay. Um, are there financial resources available to hire professionals to help start these programs within our organizations? And I will say, there are some very smart people in this room, uh, Andy and Trevor Lane and Anthony uh, Gromko, and I will do my best to hook you up. If you all want to learn more about these events, you can get onto our newsletter. Uh, we will be summarizing this uh, event today with a webinar, uh, just you, so you can just watch the whole thing again. We'll include the slide decks, the questions from the chat, and any resources that came through in the chat. Uh, I want to leave one thing with the vision that uh, BJ shared, and that was transforming entrepreneurs so they can transform the communities where they live and work. Um, every one of these investment networks has race equity on their radar and are putting together pieces and strategies and practices to reach and serve more Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. And so I'm super honored um, to be in collaboration with all of you. Any other comments or um, words uh, for the good of the order? I think, Julie, one, one thing that might just be helpful for folks to know, and then we may have some folks on the call from, from some of these areas, but, you know, we do have uh, emergent lens, as I'm calling them, um, in places like Pateros with the River Lynn, certainly the Cowlitz Wakayakum Group, Republic, OMAC, and the newest one that we heard about the other day was in Stanwood. So, uh, you know, it, there's, there's sort of a growing list of communities that are trying to pull this together and make this uh, an asset for their communities. And I just, that's a hopeful thought I'll leave with everybody. Excellent. Well, and I can't thank you all enough for having very interesting and very interactive presentations that both shine the light on the experience of the investor, how much pride they had, how much excitement they had in investing in Main Street, as well as the experience of the entrepreneurs. Beautifully done, excellent work. Thank you, all of you, and we'll sign off. Have a great day.